Amen. Well, way back in October of 2011, I saw a devotion, a little devotion for the, for the day, and it was about our Old Testament reading that we had today, about a potter and his clay. And I started thinking to myself, you know, that would be great. Whenever we have that text again, that um, reading again in worship, it'd be great to actually bring in a real-life potter as a good visual learning aid. So I started thinking, well, how, where could I find such a potter? Well, I knew that on um, University of Nebraska's campus, we have our University Lutheran Chapel, and once in a while, the chapel offers pottery classes. So I called Pastor Bill Steinbauer down there. I said, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Can you connect me with somebody who might be able to do this? And lo and behold, of course, he gave me the contact information for Gene Knudsen. I'd like you to welcome Gene Knudsen to our worship service today. <laughs> Jean is a sister in Christ. She's a member of Messiah Lutheran Church here in Lincoln. And now, back in 2011, she wasn't available to come, but I contacted her, and I said, can I keep you on the list for another time when these, this reading or this um, topic comes up? She said, of course. So we're very glad that she is here, and she is going to be helping me with my primary sermon illustration today, the relationship between the potter and clay. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we hear from the prophet Isaiah. Remember him? Isaiah began his ministry around 740 B.C. Now you remember, in the B.C. times you count backwards. So here is Isaiah. I know, I know it's kind of hard to see, I realize. 740 B.C., Elijah before him, Solomon, King David, Saul, Samuel, after him. So around 740 B.C. is when he started he was primarily the prophet during the time of King Hezekiah of the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember at one time, during King David and King Solomon, the kingdom was united. But then, because of sin and because God disappointed his people, the, the kingdom divided between um, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. That's where we're Jerusalem, Bethlehem, that area is. So Isaiah was pretty much the prophet that God sent to serve King Hezekiah during that time, right? We know that Isaiah was married. He had some children, and his um, life ended around 681 B.C. And listen to this. According to Jewish custom, the way his life ended was he was sawed in half. Now, the Bible doesn't give us that detail. It's a Jewish custom or maybe a legend, but we always mention it in sermons because it always grabs your attention and maybe keeps your attention. But anyway, possibly, since the prophets of God were not well treated by God's people, because not only did they preach gospel and how much God loves them, but they also preached God's law of warning and judgments when they were sinning. So often they weren't treated like that. I'm not going to suggest that you ever treat God's pastors the same way that you, they used to treat the prophets. Anyway, Isaiah prophesied about two main um, periods of time. The time before God's people were taken up into captivity in Babylon, and the time when they would return from Babylon. Okay, so what, let's remember that. You see, Isaiah warned God's people that they needed to repent from worshiping their idols, Baal and Asherah, and from their immorality, or that God was going to punish them. But, you know, they would do it for a while, but then they would go back to their sinful ways. So finally, God had had enough. So he allowed the Babylonians, modern day Iraq, Babylonians to come and you know, out of promised land and take them out. <coughs> Excuse me. That didn't work really well, did it? Take them back into Babylon as punishment for all their sins. But then he also preached restoration and comfort to the people, saying, you're only going to be there 70 years and I'll bring you back into the promised land. Well, today's text is part of a prayer that starts in the chapter before. and It says, O oh Lord, you are our Father, our Redeemer, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. In fact, a lot of it is a prayer of confession of sins, like we do every Sunday morning. In our sins we have been a long time. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment or like a filthy rag like Jake's song talks about. Remember not iniquity. Remember not, O oh Lord, our iniquity forever. After all they had done, why should the Lord forgive these people of 
Judah. I mean, they worshipped idols over and over again. Oh, they would maybe stop for a while because he would send prophet after prophet after prophet to come and warn them to repent, repent. And when they wouldn't, God would use the surrounding nations around them to come and basically do battle with them, right? So they repent for a while and they'd quit, but then they'd go back to their old sinful ways until God would rough up their lives once again. Well, so why should the Lord forgive these people of Judah? Based on what? Well, look at this verse right here. O Lord, you are a father. We're the clay. You are our potter for all the work of your hand. Based on that. With the words the Spirit gave to Isaiah, right? He prayed the Lord to forgive the people because he's their father. They're his children. He's the creator, the potter, and the people are the created, the clay. See, God's the one who gets to define his relationship with us. He's creator, the word the created. Have you ever heard this phrase? I know two things. There is a God and you're not him. Ever heard that one? Or there is a God and I'm not him. But you see, the problem is we like to think we are. There's many times when we decide to make decisions that are reserved for God and the Father alone, that we try to be the Father. We've got that thing, we've got it upside down, don't we? I think this next slide actually warns us against that. And earlier in Isaiah, it says, look, shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. You see, that's upside down. That clay over there does not tell Gene what to do or how to make it. No, Gene is the potter. She has the authority over the clay. She is the one who's doing this work. The clay is completely, completely dependent upon Gene and her decision on how to make that pot. Let me give you some examples, though, of how we get that upside down in our lives. The devil in the world try to say that a baby that is knit together in a mother's womb by God, oh, the world says it's just a lump of tissue. It's just a blob of potential. It's disposable if it's not wanted. That's what the devil in the world say. You see, that's an example of the thing made saying of its maker, you didn't make me. That's getting the potter clay relationship upside down. That's getting the creator created relationship all messed up. Here's another example. The devil and the world tempt us to think that life only has value if we decide that it has value. What about this? Have you ever heard anybody say, well, grandma's life doesn't have the quality of life, so we're just going to hurry things up a little bit. Wait a minute. Do we clay pots make timing decisions? that only the potter should make? Here's another example. The devil and the world say that the life of a person of us with severe disabilities really is not all that valuable. Some would say that this man's life has value, but this disabled boy's life does not. It's the same person. Have you heard this story yet? Martin Pistorius was a happy child until a rare illness made put him into a coma at the age of 12. At the age of 16, he started to become conscious, though his family around him weren't completely aware of that, and many of his family members did not see really the value in his life. In fact, at one point, in despair, in frustration with what was happening, one of his family members actually said to him, I hope you die. Sadly, Martin remembers that because he was fully aware. They didn't realize that he was aware, but he was. So when he came out of the coma, he said, I remember that, but I forgive you. You see, in that moment, in despair, in frustration, that family member was making the value on that life that was not hers to make. God is the one who creates life. God is the one who sustains life. So God's the one who gets to put the value on life. He's the potter. We're just the clay. 
miraculously, God has brought God has brought uh, Martin to a, a a long way. It's amazing what he's done, and today he lives a a functional and contented life. But Martin's life is not valuable because we say it's valuable. In fact, it's not based on his physical state. Martin's life was valuable when it was in a coma, equally as valuable as it is now. Because we clay pots don't get to say how valuable other clay pots are. The potter determines the value of us clay pots. On this Life Sunday, let's remember that all lives matter. Your life matters because one, the potter created you, and your life matters because the potter's son, Jesus, became clay for you. He lived a perfect life in your place as your substitute. He died that death because God says the wages of sin is death, so he became clay for you, but then he died for you in your place so that you would not have to suffer hell in eternity. He suffered hell on the cross for you in your place. Trusting in him, you don't have to. And that potter's son who became clay for you rose from the grave to conquer death, to say that the grave is not the end of the story. There's the new heaven, the new earth that comes after that. All the trusting in him, trusting in that, you will live with the potter forever. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, help us to always remember that you are our creator and we are the created. And that gives us perspective on our life. We thank you for all that you have done as you've created us. We ask you to help us to remember your son Jesus, who you sent to do all things necessary for our salvation. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us live as clay pots by your design. We pray this in Jesus' name.